Good morning. You're listening to Power Talks with Beth Ann and Melody Cedarstrom in the morning, where talk is real, truth is in the talk, and there is power. Absolute power in truth, and that's why we named the show Power Talks, and we welcome you today. I'm Beth Ann, and say good morning to my co-host, as uh, to Melody Cedarstrom. I can't even talk this morning, as we empower you with the truth, or we attempt to empower you with the truth. Good morning, Melody. Good morning, and good morning, listeners. It's another great day. Uh, every day's a great day. It really is. Uh, that's the only way you can look at life. Yeah, we got ups and downs, and certainly some are... Not as good as others, but uh, it's a uh, gift. That's why they call it the present. <laughs> I woke up. It's a great day. <laughs> Absolutely, we're up straight. <laughs> I know Both you want. Both of us are talking about how tired we are. We were talking about how rough the evening and the late night was. But I had a good time last evening. I was the MC at a Vitae Foundation banquet, and those are for fundraisers. And if you ever get to go to one, now Vitae is nationwide. It is nationally known, and um, its its name may not be well known everywhere, but they have done so much for the pro-life movement. And what excites me about how they do, I've been a part of them for a while, and um, I've, I've sung at a few of them, and I've... Uh, MC'd now at a couple of them. But last night's speaker, they always bring in a speaker. Sometimes it's a, a, a really, well, they're always a very interesting speaker. But it's um, the um, speaker last night was Melissa Oden. Now, I don't know if you know her story. If you've never heard her story, you need to go listen to her. She also wrote a book, and the name of the book is You Carried Me. Melissa Oden isn't supposed to be here, Melody. She was a baby that survived a saline abortion. And uh, then she was adopted. And to, to hear her tell the story, and I don't want to, to uh, you know, to, to uh, ruin it for anyone if they get to go hear her speak. Uh, her mother was forced to have this abortion by her what would be Melissa's grandmother when she was a teenager. And uh, anyway, she was, uh, they wanted her to just be left to die when she was born alive, her grandmother did, which is heartbreaking in and of itself because you think of your grandmother as being loving and caring and and, uh, uh, dawdle over you a little bit. But um, she did survive, and uh, in a very very miraculous way she has no disabilities or any disfigurement or anything like that she see she survived this after five days of saline of in that saline solution in the womb her story is a story of survival uh, emotional story of forgiveness she has since connected with some of her biological family she was adopted um and it's it's just an awesome, awesome story. But the thing with Vitae, with their pro-life movement, is they decided to do what they called right brain thinking. And uh, in that, instead of talking about the baby so much, they are about the compassion with the mother. Not judgmental, but to understand all the things that these women might be going through. And... I don't know how many people are familiar, excuse me, familiar with um, the abortion clinics, but when the young women or older women come in there, they don't, you know, they preach choice, but when you come in there, we can fix this. And this is your only choice. This is your only choice in life. That's what they pretty much tell them. And, of course, these women are desperate, and they're down, and they're alone, and they're just, you know, they don't know what to do. And maybe they are getting um, uh, pressure from someone else to have this abortion or to do this or to do that. And so it's it was a really good evening um, celebrating life because here she was. And, of course, yesterday morning, early yesterday morning, President Donald Trump, POTUS Papa, became a grandfather again for the ninth time. Uh, Eric and uh, Laura Lee, I believe is his wife's name, gave birth to a little boy named Luke yesterday morning. And as w- I was at this banquet, Melody, uh, the woman that uh, 
that brought me in there. I know her. I've known her for a long time. And uh, she said that uh, someone in her family was at the hospital that moment uh, getting ready to give birth. And uh, as I was waiting, I was also waiting for my youngest son to come visit. Uh, he wasn't going to be able to stay for the banquet, but he was bringing me a PA system because I'm going to use that, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention what I'm going to do with that on Saturday because in this little town, they have a huge festival every fall. It's called the Hammer Turkey Festival, and uh, I'm going to have uh, uh, a little table set up outside my business here, outside the studio, and so I wanted a PA system. I'm going to play some of the shows. I'm going to sing. I'm going to not. I don't think I'm going to dance, but I'm going to sing and I'm going to play the play uh, probably a memorial show that I had for the Fourth of July. Anyway, so he was bringing that to me, and he had my three-year-old granddaughter with him, and they came up from Bolivar, Missouri. So it was a little bit of a drive, an hour and a half or so drive for him to come up there. So here we're talking about life. And we have the birth of the president's new grandchild. We had a, a birth on the way, and I'm sure there was lots of babies born yesterday. But there were also lots of babies aborted yesterday. But Melody, my little grandbaby, I met, I met her. She's three and a half years old. I met her in the, in the hallway because they couldn't come in. So I went out to meet her. And she had carried all the way from Bolivar, Missouri, an hour and a half in the car, a little bitty, looks like about a half pint cur jar with water in it, and it was full of, of flowers that she had picked out of the yard, red clover, <laughs> that she brought to her Mima. <laughs> so Vitae Foundation is an awesome foundation. If you ever get a chance to check them out, it's just vitaefoundation.org. That's Vitae Foundation. Vitae stands for life. It's Latin for life. That's V-I-T-A-E. So I was very privileged and honored to be a part of that and to hear Melissa Odin's story. And if you get a chance to buy her book, it is uh, uh, called You Carried Me. But the story of forgiveness and the things, the emotion that she went through, uh, just just amazing to me. And as you know, I'm pro-lifer. So I, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's... You know, so many times we, we think about the babies, which we do need to think about the babies, but we forget about the mother. And uh, to uh, to reach out to the mother is saving the baby. And that's how they approach this. They do not approach it with a judgmental attitude or a shaking your finger in your face. Don't you know that's a life? You need to be uh, taking care of that life and da-da-da-da-da. It's not a choice. It's a life. You know, they don't approach it that way. They just let them know, and they lead them to the to the pregnancy centers. The pregnancy centers are very – there's more of them than there are abortion centers, but they're less known for some reason. They don't get the advertisement or the, the recognition. And uh, so they, they bring them to those, uh, those pregnancy centers where they are, they are ministered to as a human being, as a mother, as a, as a woman in, in, in need. Their need for – those emotional hugs and and other women tell them, you know, I've been there and it's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that's what I did last night. And I was a little late getting home. And then I had to uh, to watch the news and try to catch up. And, <laughs> and it was a late night. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like a wonderful evening and certainly it was. a good cause. And, you know, I, I I don't look at this often. I pull it up. every. Sometimes I just click on it by mistake. And But I have uh, one of my... I don't want to say it's one of my favorites or my likes because it certainly isn't. But I am connected to real time the current death toll of the United oh my, States. Yes, yes. And you know the number one death toll is abortion. Mm. And so far this year, from January one to September thirteenth, there's been seven hundred and sixty four thousand and fifty four abortions that's more than heart disease that's more than cancer tobacco obesity medical errors stroke accidents alcohol diabetes alzheimer's disease it's more than any one of these single um incidences of uh death mm. and you know it's it truly is would you speak to someone uh, that are pro-choice 
it, it just baffles me how minds can think so differently when it comes to this itty bitty baby and mm-hmm. to think that you know they, they're all concerned about their choice their life but that little baby has a life also and they should be born t- so they can make their choices and i mean it's and i used to when i was in my younger days i mean i'm talking in my 20s i probably sided a little more with abortion and but as i grew older i became more conservative i began to understand my faith mm-hmm. you know when you're young you know you you might be you know i believe my faith kept me out of trouble but you didn't recognize it as much as your faith Right. And only as you become older and you begin questioning, gee, <laughs> I sure got out of a lot of problems in my younger days, and I sure was protected. I wonder how, I, you know, when you begin to ask, you know, think about questions and and about life and so forth as you get older, you know, I became, you know, you know my faith became stronger, and, and you know, you know I recognize things. This young woman went so, through so much after she found out. She was a teenager when she found out the truth about her abortion. She said her, her adopted parents wanted both her and her sister, who was also adopted, to believe that they were loved by their parents and given up because they were loved. Mm-hmm. And, of course, she finds out later that was not the case with her. And she even went through the, what do they call it, the survival um, emotion, because why did I survive? Why did I live, you know? Um uh, she even went through that, and I just cannot imagine all that she went through. She has now connected. The grandmother would never connect. I'm sure that that's out of guilt. She just wants her to know she forgives her. But she has connected with her mother, and she says, in fact, we were texting before I came up here. But she's 40, 40 years old, and uh, it has taken her a long time um, to uh, find her birth family her biological family and she still calls her adoptive family mom and dad because that's they raised her and that is her mom and dad but uh so she is um it's it was a wonderful story of forgiveness as well as overcoming so much of the emotions and the point of it last night was abortion doesn't just take the life of the baby it affects all the lives around it think about the father she tried to connect and reach out to her biological father, and she, he never responded. She found out later that he was dealing with cancer and passed away shortly after she sent that letter. But his dad found that letter going through his items, and so she connected with that grandfather. And uh, so it affects so many people. It's not just you, the woman that's having the crisis of a unwanted pregnancy, a surprise pregnancy, or whatever you want to call it. It's it's everyone that's affected, as well as the life of the child that is ended. But so many lives are affected from from that decision, from that choice. And uh, one thing I've one thing I've always done is I've always added. I never. I, I believe people should keep learning. And this goes back to the 90s. I was doing various classes and so forth, and there was a lot of young young people. I was the old one, you know. <laughs> that was, you know, you know, 23 years mature, ago. Or more. Mature, I was the more mature one, yes. But uh, I was surprised how these young girls get pregnant. And, you know, one day they wouldn't be in class. And it's like, well, where are they? Oh, they went and had an abortion today. And I was just like, it was just so disturbing. Mm. Just and they do, yeah. It's used. It's and it's laughing. talked about like that. Yeah, as if it was nothing. Like it was uh, nothing. Because they, oh, it's just crazy. But anyway, that's what took place last evening. And I, I want to encourage all the listeners. If you ever get a chance, you need to visit vitefoundation.org. That's vitefoundation.org. You're listening to Power Talks, and we do have some other things to talk about besides what Beth did last night when we come back. And your calls are welcome at 717-300-1218. We believe there is power in you and power in truth. 717-300-1218. Melody and Beth Ann will be right back. Since the beginning of the United States, kings have sought it. Nations have fought for it. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. 
Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Yuji. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more, using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Org, C-R-O-S-S, cross the border.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's cross the border.org. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. I'm going to go straight to the phones. We have Arthur from Chicago, Illinois area. Arthur, how are you today? Good morning. Good morning, ladies. How are you? I'm Just good. fine. Thank you. Uh, you know, I listen to both of your other shows, too, you know, and when the power hour went off, I see you guys got part of their slots, so now you guys are, I hear you in the morning. Good. That's great. Good Thank you. you. I, I really love all your shows. You guys are very informative and very, very nice ladies, and I, I love to listen to you a lot. And by the way, I was curious if you guys know anything about this brown dwarf star that going to pass between the Earth and the Sun. It's supposedly supposed to be this month. Okay, I didn't quite understand that. The brown what? A brown dwarf star. Yeah. Oh, I've not heard about that. That's some kind of asteroid or something that's supposed to be flying close. One of the closest uh, um, ever, something like that. I think it's, uh, uh, I don't know when it's supposed to come by. Um, they're staying. They're staying the twenty first, twenty second, and the twenty third of this month. And there's oh, the word next word has it. It's a brown dwarf star, and it has seven celestial bodies orbiting it. Is uh, the word is what the word going around? It's supposed to pass what? twelve million miles of the planet, which is really not that far. No, that's interesting. Is, well, I have uh, had my head in the sand. I guess I hadn't heard about that. Uh-huh. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer slash uh, amateur physicist. You know, I want to be kind of, but like, I kind of, I kind of study the cosmos and all the celestial mechanics, and I'm, I, I kind of study with a James McKenney, if you know who that is. Uh, he's been on the Power Hour. Right. Um, right. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, he's the, he's the world renowned scientist right now. Very interesting man. Okay. 
Okay. Well, yeah. you know, I just wanted to, check, I wanted to check in with you guys and let you know that you got another listener and that I love your show. It's really awesome. Appreciate that, Arthur. I really do. Thank you so much. Well, I, 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 thank you, Arthur. I actually thought that that has already flown by. Um, I'll, I'll have to uh, do a little because I have here. been I have been googling it and it says a really really there's several and most of them are to be re- the the largest uh, asteroid ever tracked. This is from Forbes. Well, that one's not opening. Um, let me see if I can go to. I hate to say CNN, but <laughs> <laughs> um, a nearly three mile wide asteroid makes a relatively close call with Earth. Um, it's supposed to be early Friday, and this article was dated September 1st. Mm-hmm. So, again, that's a question of perhaps uh, if it was that time frame, what type of impact does it have on, you know, perhaps Hurricane Irma and so forth, um, the waters and so forth, and, you know, was that an impact? And that's what I said about Harvey. I mean, Harvey happened, what, two days, three days after we had the eclipse. We know the moons and the, you know, tides are all connected and so forth. And when you're dealing, you know, with water, kind of makes you wonder. I mean, it's just Well, you know, and Irma hit. Irma hit during high tide. So that was not good either. Well, it's not just high tide. So did Sandy. Sandy hit, I believe, up north on high tide because we missed it here. We were actually on low tide. And uh, But what's happening at the end of this month is I think the planets are aligning with themselves to a degree that hasn't happened for 2,000 years. Mm. So um, I think that's happening September 21st, September you know, 28th or, or something like that. Okay. And um, so I think the asteroid's gone by from what I could just detect in this last couple of minutes. But the alignment of the planets it'll be the first time in 2000 years that it has occurred and we do have joe from arkansas calling maybe he's going to update us on Ooh. on that information good morning joe hi joe how are you doing yeah good morning yeah i'm doing fine how are y'all great doing good yeah okay okay as far as these planets go and the asteroids and whatever all this stuff in the out in the cosmos is you know i don't I don't actually pay too much. I, I haven't got any news about that. I don't pay too much attention to that stuff because, you know, it, it, it doesn't really affect our lives. And, uh, and so many times I've heard them predict, you know, some so many people have said that this planet X or some asteroid or something like that is coming planet close to the X, Earth yeah. and it's going to cause all kinds of crisis and chaos and destruction and who knows what. It never does happen. So, you know, personally, I just hardly pay attention to this stuff anymore. But uh, what I did want to comment on is um, the news this morning has been playing a clip from Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders apparently recently gave a speech in which he shouted out, you know, proclaimed, health care is a right. You know, of course, they want to sell us on socialist health care, so they're, so they're uh, praising Bernie Sanders for uh, getting this idea, you know, uh, into the minds of the American people. Health care is a right, you know, whatever Bernie Sanders says. <laughs> you do him and pretty good, Bern- Joe. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I wish I had his money, that's for sure. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but what I think Bernie Sanders is doing, you know, he's proclaiming something to be that's not legitimately right, to be a right, and then ignoring what should legitimately be a right in health care. And this is why I say this. You know, he's saying health care is a right. No, it's not a right. You know, because to give us health care, you know, some health care is the fruit of somebody's education, and labor. And so what he's saying, you know, the doctors, the nurses, whoever is the health care practitioners that give us the health care, they had to study hard and work hard and, you know, learn a lot in their practice and so on like this, you know, to be able to give us uh, decent health care, good health care. And we do not have a right to that. You know, basically what Bernie Sanders is saying is that we have a right for the government to tell somebody that's educated themselves and learned a lot about health care and spent a lot of money with their education, all the kind of stuff, you know, to become a health care practitioner. Uh, Bernie Sanders is saying we have a right for the government to force that person to give us health care, whether he likes it or not, he or she likes it or not. And that, that's, that's nonsense. That's not a right. 
you know, somebody that's a health care practitioner, they should have the right to decide, you know, if, you know, generally they're good people that want to give health care to anybody that they can, anybody that they think they can help, they want to give health care to. But, you know, they, we don't have a right for the government to force them I guess, to give us health care, whether, whether, whether they like it or not. I guess we could equate but, his logic to, you know, my car's broke down, I have a right to get it fixed. Somebody needs to pay for this because I don't have the money. So somebody needs right, to pay yeah. to get my car fixed because it's sick. You know? Exactly. I mean, that's, that's just thing. absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. What you have a right to do is you have a right to go to whatever mechanic you want and make the best deal you can and get your car fixed. You have a right to do that. So it's the same thing with health care. What we should have a right to, what we really should have a natural right to, is freedom of choice in health care. You know, we should be able to go to whatever doctor or health care practitioner we want and they should be able to use whatever sort of treatment they think is going to be helpful. And um, anybody that wants to be a healthcare practitioner, I think, should be able to, uh, you know, should be free to advertise their services. And, of course, you know, it would be somebody's obligation to anybody that's advertising themselves as a doctor or a healthcare practitioner or something like that to check out the qualifications and credentials and what school they went to and, you know, how good they are and, you know, the experiences of other people with them and so on like this. You know, and and the government should be able to punish fraud, uh, but uh, otherwise, or deliberately trying to do harm or something like that. But you know, otherwise, uh, we should have freedom in healthcare, freedom to go what, to whatever sort of doctor or practitioner we want, and the freedom of the practitioners uh, to use whatever treatments they right. want. You know, and as long as and they're not it, doing something deliberately harmful or fraudulent, uh, we should have that kind of freedom. But Bernie Sanders doesn't talk about that kind of right. You know, which is our legitimate right. Yeah, but, but you no, know what's it, it interesting, we, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but what's interesting is yeah. how they're promoting Bernie's plan is by using a key word of freedom and security. And that's how they'll promote this program. Um, because, you know, they're going to say, oh, under Bernie's, plan, uh, under Bernie's plan, Americans will benefit from the free freedom and security that comes with finally separating health insurance from employment. Well, how about the freedom that we get from finally separating health insurance from the government? You know, and how about, uh, you know, once hospitals became uh, into play for, 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 for profit, um, you know, the health care system just fell. And, and here we are today. It's been in a long process. And once you started having CEOs and shareholders to respond to and make sure that doctors and hospitals and, and you know, the whole health industry uh, becomes profitable instead of supplying, there's nothing wrong to make a profit. But on the other hand, um, your health care has been controlled for a very long time since the creation of the HMOs, PPOs. I've said this before. I mean, and everybody thought it was great because at that point in time, you basically could go to the doctor and you didn't have to pay any money out of pocket. You just went, you know, as long as it wasn't anything that they deemed uh, too expensive for you. And But they started taking control. They started making decisions for your health care instead of you and your doctor. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, how do we fix it all? How do we fix it all? Well, free market is how to fix that. I mean, they're, they're controlling the, the medical field, and uh, they control the insurance companies, control the prices, they control. You can't go back to a free market because the insurance companies are broke. <laughs> and that's part of the problem. <laughs> Part of this is, you know, subsidies to the insurance companies because if they weren't getting the subsidies from the governments, they'd all collapse. Probably all of them. So there'd Would still only be, be so one or two. So, that, you, so yeah. you have a choice of one and two. And how long does this take? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to have a free market within six months or a year. Well, there are a lot of doctors that are doing the uh, no insurance and, and, uh, uh, you go in and you 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 know they tell you what the fee is going to be, uh, and you can shop around. I mean they have doctors that are signed up with this, and you can shop around for the doctors. And and uh, instead of going through an insurance company, now if you have insurance, you can turn it into them. But it, it's not gone. It doesn't go from the doctor's office to the insurance company. You you deal directly with the doctor, and um, and 
that has been working for a lot. I mean, that's the one I went to uh, here a month ago. I went to the FMMA, which is the Free Medical Market Free Market Medical Association, and they have a, a surgical center down in Oklahoma. That that's exactly what they do. And um, anyway, we've we've botched it up. There's no doubt about it. And the insurance has been the problem. Insurance and uh, the government getting their nose into it has been the problem. So they call the shots. They tell you what they're going to charge. They tell the doctors what they're going to charge or the hospitals, and they're all in cahoots together, not necessarily all the doctors, but the hospitals and, and um, the, you know, the wonderful FDA that approves this and approves that and the pharmaceutical industry. And it's just it, – it's, it's a mess. And um, – and there's no reason for some pill to cost you what it costs, what they tell you the well, amount. Yeah, we subsidize the world's pharmaceuticals, you know. Oh, my gosh. You know, every other country in the, the, on the planet pays pennies compared to what we pay because we subsidize their health care. Mm-hmm. It's time America stops subsidizing everyone and everything. That might be a start. Yeah. Joe, I thank you for your call. I have a little something about Bernie Sanders as well. <laughs> Apparently, he doesn't feel like his creditors have a right to get paid. Uh, Democrat Senator Bernie Sanders of 2016 campaign, he still owes a disputed $450,000 to various different municipalities and Vermont lawmakers visited throughout the race. <laughs> it said, uh, while Sanders' campaign racked up a debt all across the county in Arizona, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Washington, and Wisconsin. Much of the outstanding debt is owed to the localities in California. Sanders has visited that state often in, in search of sympathetic audience to rally around his single-payer health care push, and he keeps pushing that. And of course, you know, the, uh, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, oh, lost her name. I've got it right in front of me here. Some Elizabeth Warren. I call her Lizzie. Elizabeth Warren and also Senator Kamala, Kamala Harris. They're all on, on Bernie's side with this, but apparently Bernie hasn't uh, paid his creditors yet from his campaign. It says in here that Clinton and Trump, they've already settled up with all their 26, 2016 debts with that, but apparently Bernie hasn't. But I know he bought a house. That's what I was saying. I thought he bought a house. Right after he dropped out of the primary, but apparently he can't pay his bills. So, well, no, they had to buy the new home. <laughs> I, I have to chuckle. Yeah, I know. I have to chuckle. What was the comment? It was in this. Uh, oh gosh, I can't find it. I was looking at it here just a second ago. Um, medical for Medicare for all. Medical for Medicare for all is what he's pushing, which is you know government funded health care. Insurance. Let's not call it care. It's insurance. That's yeah, what it is. But you know, when you know, I, re- I, 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 I relay free, this free education and free medical. <laughs> I relay this story of a conversation I had with a a friend that is, you know, pays very little for health care, and the discussed. I probably mentioned on this program before, and we were talking health care, and she says, "You don't want me to have health care," and these. There's no critical thinking behind these plans of Bernie Sanders and what it means. There's no critical thinking with these people when it comes to the the Affordable Care Act. And it's just like, no, don't you get it? The problem is and I, it's not that I don't want you to have health care. I want to address the problem as to why health care is not affordable for you. Let's get to the root of the problem. Let's just not cover it up and give you something so that you can have it and people, you know, end up getting 60% premium increases year after year after year, putting them in into, you know, debt to pay for your health care. Let's fight. Let's, you know, get government out of it because that's not going to help. No, but they them don't in see ever. it that way. They see it as you're trying to take away something from them. It's like no, you, because you they should... see it. They've bought into that story as as Joe was saying that it's your right. It's your right. I don't see that. I, in the it's not right. a right. They don't. Um, so many Americans don't understand or appreciate. 
that independence. You know, the Declaration of Independence was to get the government out of your lives, not to have them control your lives. And they're not the rescuer. <laughs> the government is not the rescuer. When I'm talking about government, I'm talking about the King Government Incorporated. Because as we were set up as a republic, we the people are supposed to be the government. Now, if that's what we want, I know you and I don't. I know Joe don't, and I know Arthur probably doesn't. I've really got some good English going here, don't I? <laughs> and, <laughs> English teachers are going, eh, eh, eh. But, <laughs> but that freedom of independence to get away from the government controlling your lives, regulating your lives, and, and uh, taxing you for here and for there and for everything, um, where you travel. What, what if we if we go back and read that Declaration of Independence? You can just see the parallel from what they were fighting and dealing with to now, even immigration. But back then, it was because the king wouldn't let anybody come into the country because he was afraid they were going to get multiple and strong, and he wouldn't let them come in here. He was controlling that. Um, and uh, some people would say, well, that's a, an excuse to bring everybody in, but that's not what it was at all. But if you look at the parallels in the Declaration of Independence, what our founding fathers were grieving about, what their grievances were with the king, it is parallel with what's going on now. I, I, actually, I think we've got it worse. I think we've allowed it to get worse. And it can only continue to get worse because there isn't – now we're in such a spot financially – that things can't, you know, because that's what had. And again, yes, I'm a. I sell gold and silver. I believe <laughs> in real money. And we can't until we get off that fiat currency system. Uh, it has opened the doors for bigger and and uncontrollable spending by governments, and we, we've put ourselves in a position where the the things that we could could fix, we can't because of that. When you're just too far in debt, when you're controlled, when you have other countries that own our debt, uh, have our dollars, they they could, that's, we're no longer independent as a nation either. No, we're not. We're not sovereign anymore. Not anymore. So how do we pretend we are? We pretend. And as long as that confidence, as long as that, as long as that illusion is uh, um, not broken up, I mean, we still remain a, you know, a viable country. But that slowly erodes. That that curtain of illusion opens up, and people finally see, and that confidence is lost, and and all of a sudden, you know, we have someone bigger and stronger, and. And uh, I think this is what we're seeing now. I think you're seeing a lot of countries that are positioning themselves. They know this can't last. They see where it's headed. Just because this pe- the people in this country don't read history, that doesn't mean that other people around the world don't read history and understand history. In fact, I was always amazed when we were in when we were in Europe. I was amazed at the knowledge that people on the street have about history and our history. They know more about our history than the citizens on our streets know. (laughs) And it just, it always fascinated me. And I even made comments about that. Like, wow, you know more about our history. (laughs) Than most of us. Yeah. And uh, so they understand where this is heading. And I, I guess it's just a matter of trying to keep heads above water. Until it actually sinks. But. Well, I think, too, the education department, you know, uh, in this country has fallen so short of what it should be doing. Well, I, actually, we shouldn't have a education department as far as federal government's concerned. But to educate our children, we just go through the motions. Yeah, we want them to learn to add and subtract and multiply and divide. But to teach history, to teach um, good citizenship... Uh, to teach the things that that uh, they need to know to survive in life. Uh, that comes from home, actually, that part. But it, um, we have failed, because, and we just go through the motions. When you look at other countries, let, let's uh, 
let's talk about some some of our Asian friends and countries. They take education very seriously. I had uh, uh, a group of um, singers that were from the uh, Southwest Baptist College in Bolivar, Missouri. Up, this was several years ago. My, my son, my oldest one, graduated from there. He does sing. He he leads music. He's a a minister of music. And uh, so they came up and they sang at the church we were attending at that time. And uh, I I uh, housed all the all the male singers out of that group because I had a son. Well, some of them were out playing basketball. Some of them were horsing around doing other things. This was before cell phones, so they'd have been on that. But the one young man who was Asian was studying. <laughs> he was studying. He took his education seriously. And I have seen that not just – and I'm not trying to be racist in saying that. It's just that they were raised that way, to take it seriously. This is something you need to do, something you need to know uh, and we don't do that here in the United States of America. We don't teach our children how important school is for you to learn, whether you're homeschooling or using public school or private school, whatever the case may be, how important your education is and how to apply the things you learn to your life. It, just, it seems to me that so many times they're just going through the motions, you know, and uh, you know, it doesn't seem to matter. You know, in California last year, was it last year? It was first of, first of this year or last year? I've got I'm losing track. You no longer have to pass a test to graduate. You don't have to pass a test to graduate. You just get a participation graduation, I guess, diploma. I participated in high school. I got a diploma. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy what we're sending these kids out in the in the world and they are not prepared <laughs> they are not prepared for the world that's why they need safe spaces in college they're not prepared i'm sorry i kind of went off and chased a rabbit there didn't i <laughs> i think i put melody to sleep are you still there melody <laughs> you're listening to power talks this is beth ann and melody in the morning where we believe that truth is in there's power in truth and when we talk the truth there's power in that talk your calls are welcome at 717-300-1218. That's 717-300-1218. And Melody and Beth Ann will be right back. The Civil War did not end slavery, but it did put over 8 million black and white Southern... Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed. It has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. 
Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. And we have returned. You're listening to Power Talks. It's Melody and Beth Ann in the morning. We are in the final segment of today's show. I kind of went on a little rampage. <laughs> I thought I'd lost Melody, but she accidentally oh, put her mic on mute. <laughs> she was just, you're messing with me, weren't you? You had to tell them, Beth. You had to tell them. I did. I I ratted you out, didn't I? (laughs) Yes, you did. Now, how professional is that, Beth? (laughs) I'm sorry. All right. All right. But But I I was scared. I thought I'd really lost you, and I was scared. (laughs) Uh, You can't get rid of me that easy. (laughs) Well, I'm glad. (laughs) But, uh, Hurricane, let's switch uh, topics here a little bit. Hurricane Irma. You know, we, we talked yesterday or Monday a little bit about the, oh, the looting that was going on, uh, the videos of the people breaking into the shoe store and so forth yes. and whatnot. Uh, but there's additional reporting that uh, there was thieves with sledgehammers mm. that broke their way into, I don't know where Little River businesses are, and, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's in the... Um, Occupy the Junctions, Lofts Building, Miami's Little River District. Uh, Fourteen businesses were broken in, papers strewn, pictures ripped off the walls, and it's not. Then that is not was not due to the uh, hurricane. hurricane. Uh, TVs were stolen and so forth. Uh, uh, thieves were armed with sledgehammers, powerful enough to tear through the metal doors that were supposed to keep the building safe from the hurricane force winds. Um, Stuart Jordan, who owns Edge Orthopedics and Junction Lofts, said once inside, the thieves stole everything that they could, and then they decided to make a mess of it. Yeah, they just can't go in the steel. They have to destroy everything that was in there anyway. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, you, you think... If this happens, when a hurricane goes through, and they have the um, they have the ability to do this, what do you think it's going to happen when we have more of a so, more of an economic um, collapse, and people are going hungry, and here they're targeting businesses, but wait until their focus gets targeted to residential these thieves obviously think they have a right to have someone else <laughs> oh, they, they must be democrats <laughs> <laughs> think they have a right but oscar yeah. we haven't heard from oscar to, uh lately and he's calling oh, in from oscar. carolina yeah oscar good morning good morning ladies how are you we're fine. good how are you doing uh i'm doing fine as always i was uh, very attentive uh, listening to your program to your remarks, and uh, something called my attention about uh, what uh, Stefan was saying in regards to the uh, schooling and everything. Education. Mm-hmm. Education, absolutely. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, I have something in mind in reference to that. Uh, you know, everything that is going on in the schooling system, in the school system today, as mm. you well know, they have taken uh, out the programs, things such as the, the, the history books. Now they're teaching the, the kids a different manner of uh, learning things, everything based upon computers and so forth. So, you know, all that thing about subtracting, uh, dividing, multiplying, uh, uh, reading and writing is history. If the computer doesn't tell them how to do it, they don't do it because they don't know. 
they don't know anything about history simply because they do not teach them. And I believe all That's that right. is being done by design to keep the kids in the dark, because that way they're going to grow up to be, and I'm so sorry to have to say this, but this is my feeling about it, they're going to grow up to be a little burritos and two legs with no <laughs> base about nothing. You know, because that was the comment of Mr. Nikita Khrushchev when he came mm-hmm. to America back in the 60s, that uh, they wouldn't have to fire not one bullet in order to take this country. They would do it through uh, different sources. And I believe that is the program. It's all being done by design. You know, we've got an opposition government here that is very much socialist, communist, and they are uh, promoting this type of thing. Now in the universities, the only thing they promote is communism and everything. Everybody that comes out of there is very socialist, uh, you know, oriented. And, and that's, that is my uh, feeling about that. Now, uh, uh, on reference well, to the let second me add point to that this. I want to bring up. I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, let me add just one one thing to the education, because what you're saying is absolutely right. And in that beware of the useful idiots that has been going around with Sal Alinsky's uh, um, eight points on how to, eight steps on how to create a complete socialistic state. Number six is education. To take control of what people read and listen to, take control of what the children learn in school. Well, I agreed. But something that I think is even more, that has been more dangerous is they have removed their ability to think. You know, they allow computers to think for them. There's no logic. There's no critical thinking that these kids can do anymore. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so it's... I just couldn't agree more. You remind us so true. And you know, Oscar, with with the writing... uh, Go ahead. I've got a question for you, ladies. Uh, it, it's, it's in reference to what happened just recently with the, the two storms that we had, the uh, awesome amount of destruction and, uh, and, and loss of life, loss of everything. You know, my question in reference to this is this. How is it that in, in view of what just happened, the stock market keeps going up and up and up and up, and they're bringing the gold down, down, down? Uh, I also think... That also is, is a computer monopoly game designed to do so because, you know, I mean, it, my common sense tells me that that is impossible. How can that be? If that is a question that I have for you, ladies. If you can answer it to me, I'll be most happy. Meanwhile, okay. that's all I have to say. I wish you a pleasant day, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Appreciate Oscar. That. I'm going to turn that one over to you, Melody. That's kind of in your, your line. You know, I mean, he's absolutely correct. I mean, they've been manipulating the markets for years and years, and oh, I've absolutely. said, and I've said for years and years, they've got somebody sitting behind a little computer screen that is just typing in the numbers. Might be a little more uh, advanced now. Perhaps they don't have twenty people sitting there behind a computer screen. <laughs> Perhaps they just have one now that inputs oh, all these, Siri. this information. They got Siri. <laughs> they got Siri, got Siri doing, Siri doing it. it. Yeah, make those stock markets higher. But it's it's, it's to, to me what's also fascinating is when you go to Venezuela, you're looking at total destruction of this country. You know, mm-hmm. people are starving. They're begging. They're, 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 you read where they're going hungry and killing animals and dogs and, and to eat and so forth. Their stock market's hitting all-time highs. Of course, they're having hyperinflation, which is showing that number, and I doubt those people that are really being affected and so forth by the destruction of that country, they don't have a you know, they don't have any money anyway. But uh, so uh, it is. It's all done by computers. It's all manipulating. It isn't real anymore. And you get more and more warnings from from Goldman Sachs. You get more and more warnings from Warren Buffett. He says it might show that we have a, a 3.1 GDP, but it sure doesn't feel like it. So everybody knows the warning signs are all there. And yet... There's no fear, and, and that's just, it's just a, to me, it's, it's people should be panic. I mean, they shouldn't be panicking, but they should be making their decisions, and it shows that uh, the gold's been manipulated, the stock market's been man- manipulated, and it's just not here. It's all around the world. It's yeah. all around the world. You look at China and all of these markets. 
all of the positive reports that come out, they've all been stimulated by central banks. If it wasn't for the central banks, where will we be? Where would we be? And once those central banks begin pulling back, China's central banks, Europe's central banks, you know, all of them are central bank. Once they start pulling back, what do you think you're going to expect? Maybe we'll get a little bit of reality that shows and tells us that, gee, I guess things aren't as good as what these stock markets are showing. you got President Trump. Hey, I, I voted for the guy. I hope he can be there when the system collapses. But he's surrounded by Goldman Sachs people. I mean, <laughs> I mean, things are controlled by these banks, by the bankers. That's who controls it all. So, and I think they're controlling the clock because I hear the music and we're out of time. <laughs> Good questions, Oscar. Thank you. And I want to thank Arthur also from thank Chicago. Thank you very much. He was a oh, first time, he was a first time caller. And of course, also awesome. we have Joe. Thank you all. We thank you all for being with us as we try to logic through the news and bring common sense and truth to you. We believe there is power in the truth and Power Talks. And we thank you for being with us today. And we will see you again tomorrow morning. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org the book of revelation says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of jesus christ this is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. 
or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.